The scripture this morning comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. All this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, one does not know. Everything that confronts them is vanity, since the same fate comes to all, to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to those who sacrifice and those who do not sacrifice. As are the good, so are the sinners. Those who swear are like those who shun an oath. This is an evil in all that happens under the sun, that the same fate comes to everyone. Moreover, the hearts of all are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. But whoever is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward, and even the memory of them is lost. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, Never again will they have any share in all that happens under the sun. So go, eat your bread with enjoyment, and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has long ago approved what you do. Let your garments always be white. Do not let oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that are given to you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hands find to do, do with all your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. For the word of God in scripture. For the word of God among us. For the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. So far in our series on joy, We've covered finding joy in every season, finding joy in our work, and now we turn our eyes toward finding joy in worship and joy with God. Now, I have to admit, friends, I've been dreading preaching this scripture for weeks and weeks. And that fact has brought about some really interesting conversations with friends, particularly preacher friends. They've pretty much all gone something like this. Joy? In worship? With Ecclesiastes? With Presbyterians? Eek. Then a conversation with a dear friend and a lifelong Presbyterian a few days ago went something like this. Hey, what are you preaching on Sunday? Joy and worship from Ecclesiastes. Nicole, there doesn't actually seem to be much joy in the Bible. I mean, it's there, I guess, but it's more of a, you'll get your joy later, you know, like when you're dead. Until then, here's a bit more suffering, right? Now, don't worry. We went on to have a really lovely conversation about how even through the chaos of the past 18 months, through personal tragedies and many deaths of multiple friends and loved ones, this friend had managed to find joy in the tiniest of things. But it wasn't lost on me that none of those things were things that she categorized as worship or as connected to the church. Friends, obviously we've got a PR problem in the church. Or maybe that's really pointing us to a bit of a theological issue. If we believe that the chief end of humanity is to glorify God and worship and enjoy God forever. Why does it seem so hard to find joy in worship? Not a little cursory happiness either, but real, deep, abiding joy. The kind that fills you up and gets you through the week. Perhaps we've leaned a little bit too far into our puritanical roots or taken that whole frozen chosen thing a bit too seriously. Or perhaps we've forgotten the real truth. That worship isn't just something that happens one hour in one place on Sunday morning. Worship 
when it comes from the heart of a person who knows that God is present in their lives and in the lives all around us, is everywhere, in everything. I was reminded of this this past week in the most Presbyterian and least frozen place on earth, at Montreat, as we took our youth to the Montreat Youth Conference. The theme for this year's conference is called To Connect. And our youth and youth from all over spent the whole week connecting with God, and with nature, with each other, and with themselves through worship and small groups, plenaries and games. And as I watched even the shyest of them dive in, the lens of my life shifted a bit looking at the world around me. Whether we were doing silly energizer dances in the auditorium, rock hopping in the creek or playing and losing trivia, hiking umpteen miles between our cabins and Lake Susan, or oddly enough, listening to Sinatra over dinner. It all felt different. It all felt alive. Suddenly, there was nothing left but worship and joy. Now, I've had this experience on that mountain many times before. So much so, in fact, that I think I've come to almost expect it. I know that God is there that joy is there, and when everything gets a little too crazy, if I get in my car and drive to Montreat, I know I'll find God there again. And I'm not alone in that either. I've always attributed that to the space itself. But this week, reading these centuries-old words of another preacher, it occurred to me that it might not actually be the place at all but the presence and intention that we bring to it. Where else would hundreds of teenagers willingly put down their phones to learn ridiculous dance moves together and do them in public, like with people videoing it? Where else do adults regularly run to embrace old friends like kids on the playground? Or stand shoulder to shoulder in the dark to line a lake and hold candles just to mark the end of something special. Everything is joy and worship at Montreat because we know from the start that it's going to end. It's going to end way too soon. And so we choose to be present for it. Life inevitably leads to death, Ecclesiastes tells us. It's unfair, and sometimes it all seems random, and then you die. So enjoy it. Be present for it. Seize it. Eat bread. Do it with gusto. Drink the good wine. Wear your favorite clothes. Use the good china. God takes pleasure in your pleasure. Relish life with your spouse, whom you love. And with each and every day of your precarious life, show up. For each day is God's gift. It's all you get in exchange for the hard and sometimes exhausting work of just staying alive. This moment right here is all that we're guaranteed. But I know who lives like that all the time, right? Who can do that? Well, children do. They bring us into their little worlds with their endless but whys and looks. And will you play with me? Scientists do, probing the universe with never-ending questions, wondering and pushing the limits, noticing every tiny detail, and then offering it back to us as glimpses of the wonder that's right in front of us all the time. Poets do, too, as they sift through the chaff of life, distilling it down to its very essence and then handing it back to us, their words sticking to our hearts, showing us what we couldn't have seen on our own. This week, I found myself coming back again and again to Mary Oliver's words in the summer day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This 
grasshopper. I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down into the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? It sounds a lot like Ecclesiastes. It's joy and worship, communion and connection, if I've ever heard it. It reminds me of Jesus, one who was always present, always noticing people and things, seeing the woman at the well, seeing the lepers who needed healing, seeing everyone around him that nobody else saw, and showing up, being right there, present in the moment, even to the very last, because it is all worship, and it is all joy. Beloved, if we are present to the complex symphonies of our lives, we too might find that there is worship and joy in every beautiful, painful, chaotic note, and that that joy only grows when we let others in to share it with us. For this is what we were made for, connection and community, joy even amidst sorrow, life, vibrant, beautiful life even in the face of death. So maybe this week, put down your phone, sing out, dance, open your heart and your home, share what you own, give away what you have, revel in creation, enjoy your loved ones, figure out your gifts and share them with the world. Spend time with God treasure the good, good news that we are all beloved because it's all going to end. Let's be present for every little bit of joy we can until then. Thanks be to God. Amen.